And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who really understands Daylight Savings Time. Wow, what a beautiful day it is here. And by the way, we're back on the mainland. Uh, we are not on Milleronia today. And I always miss Milleronia when I'm not there, and so does Colonel Jeff. And so do our doggies who are here in the studio with us. And uh, we're... Uh, well, my wife is actually out back because we have a pool and someone is uh, making a bid on it to fix the pool. That's all that need be said, fix. Yes, you know, when you have something like a pool, you really only have to say, we have to fix the pool. It doesn't really matter what's wrong with it in Southern California where there are, as you know, plenty of earthquakes and plenty of slightly rusty rebars that get popped out of the concrete. And in any case, all is well, and it's a beautiful day here, and uh, which always means so much to me, and to the colonel as well, and to the doggies as well, as they're, well, uh, they laid themselves down here on the studio floor, which they enjoy doing. And, of course, that's the Stephen Hawking Orchestra, and the Sala Kirshner Dancers, featuring boy tenor Brad Simpson, asking the musical question... If after a few cocktails you decide to fly to Florida instead of driving, is that a level of drinking? No. No, it's not. It's a level of adulthood, which has nothing to do in many ways with drinking. Good question, Brad. But, see, uh, there are five levels of drinking, and getting drunk to the fifth level is not helped by doing something responsible, which is an adulthood thing to do, which is, well, instead of packing into a car at your college in western Massachusetts to drive to Florida, which I did twice, not making it twice, by the way, and uh, but if by doing that, you know what? That that fun is not helped by doing something responsible, as I just said. And here's the proof, okay? Fifty years after you take the flight, you will not be telling that story to your grandchildren, will you? And that's because it's not an adventure story anymore. Though you can tell that story to them, and then and then we decided not to drive. We we took a flight, and they'll check their watches and go watch TV, and that's the truth of it. But Grandpa will be famous for packing into a four-door Chevy and driving to Florida. And that's the truth of that. Good question, Brad. But if after a few cocktails you decide to fly to Florida instead of driving, is that a level of drinking? No, pal. No. It's a level of adulthood. And uh, we want adventure and fame, don't we? I know you do too, Brad. And I know all of you guys do. That's right. In fact, go for the adventure in life. Go for making a stand and being, well, adventurous, as Stephen Hawking did, for instance. And uh, he just passed away, and he was 76 years old when he passed on. And boy, oh boy, I mean, a lot of folks have said in their commentaries on the Internet all over it, it's, and it's true that... Uh, he might be one of the greatest scientists we've ever had here on Earth. He's English. He was English. And, well, what a head and what a heart this man had with all the things that went wrong with him physically. And to which he never said, I give up, by the way. Stephen Hawking, quite a fella. God bless you and your adventures now in the next life. And I mentioned Salah Kirshner as well. Speaking of someone who really stood up in life and just passed away, she was 94 years old. And Salah was 
in seven different concentration camps in World War II in Germany and Poland. And uh, her family, well, they were a Jewish family, and that was not popular to be in the concentration camps. That's what got you there in the first place. And you know what, though? How do you like this lady? She kept a diary of all her years, and this is five years total, that she was in these camps, seven different concentration camps, and it was a box of all these things that she wrote and saved, and a box of all these things that she painted and and saved. And she took that with her, that box, when she came to America, when she came to the United States, and she didn't show it to anyone. She was afraid that after all she'd been through, that her family here in America, the ones that she wound up having, would be punished for that somehow, if uh, anyone knew and discovered what she had. And she was wrong that in 1990 it was, roughly, that she became known and became interviewed and became, well, the, the heroine she is. And and she wound up showing her daughter where she hid this and what it was because, and she was right again, because, you know, you don't want to just have that thing sitting in a house hidden if no one knows where it is. So she showed her daughter and Sala Kirshner just passed away at age 94. And you never know in life, folks, what a, what a stance she took, what heroism she showed and what well what what a, what a life she led and i think that's one of those lives by the way where god's uh, going to give her a chance to say by the way want to see some of the fellows who uh murdered the rest of your family there and she'll probably say you know i would and after a while so he'll take her where they are which is not a happy place and uh, after a while, she said, you know what? If you don't mind, I'd just as soon go back up and sit down on a cloud somewhere. So in any case, folks, those are, those are te- well, two people worth mentioning. That means a lot to me, and it means a lot to Colonel Jeff. And by PayPal. That's right. PayPal is still one of the greatest companies we have in the world and in America. And PayPal, you know what? Folks, if you work with them, sometimes you feel like you're saving the world yourself. And who knows, maybe you are. So if you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you would like to send a few bucks here to help out. And why wouldn't you? Well, you can do it all through PayPal. And instead of saying donate, this is what what I feel. Instead of donate or pay what you like, or join the Platinum Committee, I always like to say, buy us some drinks. That's a good way to show it. That There are different levels, as we've just mentioned, levels one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> I still love that guy. Yes! <laughs> And that's another good uh, lesson for us, to, by the way, for Brad. That, that He had a terrific question. But, yeah, you don't want to, if that's part of a comedy, but you don't want to say, uh, you scream out there, hey, we were going to drive to Florida, but just, you know, uh, calm down and took a flight instead. <laughs> that's, that guy would not be yelling yes there. He would start to and then say, wait, what? So in any case, though, PayPal is a great group, and uh, do it, donate through PayPal. What what you want to do is get to PayPal, number one. You can do that, of course, on any computer, on your laptop, on your iPhone, whatever you have, but don't do it that way. Look for the PayPal banner on our website. We have it there. We have a banner that says PayPal. Go to our website, which, as you know, is LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have had the fish. And uh, you know what, though? That's, that's a great way to do it. We'll get you to PayPal. 
Just click the banner there and go take a nap in your lazy boy chair. Every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit here. And thank you, folks. It means a lot. And also thank you to everyone who's contributed already and has just been talked into it. Thank you, folks. It uh, Well, it really means a lot. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. I love doing this. I love passing on a good joke and... Uh, the Colonel and I both hope that if you like it, you pass it on too to someone in your family or your loved ones or your friends. And uh, well, we we both got a kick out of this one. We think it's pretty good. Uh, and there's a popular bar and uh, sitting at a table alone, and it's very well attended, all sorts of different kinds of people. And uh, sitting at one of the tables alone, is an elderly Jewish man, and he's got uh, he's got the rabbi's beard and the black coat and the black hat, and he's got everything, and he's sitting there, just not doing anything, not bothering anyone, just sitting there. And uh, a skinhead comes into the bar. They haven't had any of those, but the skinhead comes in, and he looks around, and he checks the crowd out, and he checks the bar out. Then he sees this old rabbi sitting there, and he th- thinks to himself that. What in the world is that guy doing? You know what? I'll take care of him. I'm going to show him what uh, what's what's happening, really. And so this guy, the skinhead, just uh, spreads his legs in the middle of the bar there and and shouts out as loud as he can, "Hey, I'm going to buy a drink for everyone in this bar on me." And he points at the rabbi and says, except him. And the bartender, well, gives everybody a drink, and he's just, and the, that skinhead is happy now. He said, I must have put him in his place. And he turns and looks at him again, and the guy's just sitting there smiling. The old man, and, and the skinhead is, what? what is he, just smiling? I do that, and he's smiling? And he, and he says, all right, and he screams again. He stands there, bartender. I want you to give champagne to everyone in this bar except him. And he raised the stakes, and he does it again. And he says, it's on me, all on me, except him. And he looks around now. I guess I showed him there. And he looks around, looks at the rabbi again. He's smiling even more. He's he's got a bigger smile, and the the skinhead is really getting under his skin even for a skinhead. And you know what? He says, oh, this is, this is too much now. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't allow this. I can't take it. And now, again, he stands in the middle of the room, spreads his legs and says, bartender, I'm going to buy a full cocktail of top shelf liquor for everyone in this bar, except him. And he points at the rabbi again, except him, except him and now he looks over at the guy again now the guy's laughing he's not just smiling he's he's laughing and this drives the skinhead nuts and the skinhead walks over the bartender and he just says what's wrong with that guy what is he insane he's driving me out of my mind was is, is he crazy is he the one out of his mind why is he just laughing and the bartender says oh no no he's fine he owns the place (laughs) <laughs> we thought that was pretty good. <laughs> oh, you mean, oh, you idiot. Well, that's a pretty good joke. And as always, remember, if you like that, pass it on and tell them where you got it. And uh, that brings me to my second favorite part of the show, the Poetry Corner. Nothing like a string quartet before a poem. Actually, there must be things like that, but not here, not at the Larry Miller Show. And this is a wonderful poem, folks. It's beautiful. It's called A Prayer in Spring by the great Robert Frost, one of the most wonderful poets our country has ever produced. 
And uh, he lived from 1874 to 1963, and by the way, taught at Amherst College, where I went to school. And uh, what a great poet, what a great thinker, what a great, well, Yankee, Yankee poet. And uh, this is a lovely one. I hope you like it. It's called A Prayer in Spring by Robert Frost. Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today, and give us not to think so far away as the uncertain harvest. Keep us here, all simply in the springing of the year. Oh, give us pleasure in the orchard white, like nothing else by day, like ghosts by night, and make us happy in the happy bees, the swarm dilating round the perfect trees. And make us happy in the darting bird that suddenly above the bees is heard, the meteor that thrusts in with needle bill and off a blossom in midair stands still. For this is love, and nothing else is love, the which it is reserved for God above, to sanctify to what far ends he will, but which it only needs that we fulfill. Isn't that lovely? And the great Robert Frost, and I always say great before his name, he has moved me and taught me so often. And I'm glad that, well, I could bring that to you today. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show, The Magic Movie Moment, MMM Triple M. This is a great movie, folks. And, well, I guess like Robert Frost, but it is. It's from 1946, and it's called My Darling Clementine. Directed by John Ford, starring, oh, what a cast, Henry Fonda, Walter Brennan, Tim Holt, Ward Bond, Victor Mature, Linda Darnell, and, of course, Kathy Brown as Clementine Carter, a.k.a. my darling Clementine. Well, you know what, folks? There are many wonderful Wyatt Earp movies made, and the Earp Brothers, and the shootout at the OK Corral. There are many, and they've been very, very good. Some have been terrific. And uh, and some you've seen, and maybe some you haven't. This is one you need to see. It's Henry Fonda as the great Wyatt Earp. And, oh, what a story. And it's called also My Darling Clementine, because, well, Clementine is the woman he falls in love with. And she falls for him, too. And he gets in well. This is when he gets into the trouble and meets the Clantons as well. And that builds to, as you know, the shootout at the O.K. Corral. Victor Mature, God bless him. By the way, he plays Doc Holliday. And what a great actor he was. I loved him. Linda Darnell playing Chihuahua, who is the uh, a saloon girl named Chihuahua. And she's, oh, she's gorgeous and a great actress. She always was. But boy, oh boy, Wyatt Earp was right in this. You take one look at Clementine, and you, and you would say, any man would say, she's the one for me. And uh, the magic movie moment I like so much here. There are so many great moments in this movie and so many great scenes. Walter Brennan, and I keep saying great today, but he is, oh, what an actor the great Walter Brennan was in so many ways, so many parts. And Walter, uh, well, plays Old Man Clanton, the head of the Clanton boys. And he's his sons, well, Ike and the others are right around him, and they, they're trouble. And you know it the second you meet them and see them. And you know it, and I know it. And Henry Fonda and his brothers, well, you know, and Ward Bond and Tim Holt, and uh, as I said, Victor Mature, they have a cattle drive that they're making, and they left them out of town. They took a little break to go into town 
just for one night. And it doesn't go so well, as you can imagine. And Henry Fonda, we see, meets Walter Brennan and his sons, but neither knows who they are. And uh, it's in a little, oh, a uh, place. I th- think it's a restaurant, a bar, but it's uh, or a hotel. And it's just the Clanton boys and headed by Walter Brennan are mean people. And you see it on Walter's face. He's not kidding around, and they they talk to Henry Fonda, and then I mean, again, no one knows who the other one is. This is the night they meet, and you know what, folks, it reminds me of that Sean Connery is the first James Bond, the greatest James Bond, and in the first movie, Doctor No, when in the opening scenes he's in a casino and he's playing. Not Baccarat or something. Well, maybe it's Baccarat. He's playing some card game with the Countess, and she's a lovely young woman, and they're all fancy dressed, and she's got a gown on and the pearls and the diamonds, and he sits down, and Sean Connery sits down the other side of the table, and he starts beating her and beating her, and then he, he's he got that look that we had never seen before, and he takes a cigarette out to light it, and the Countess says, Well, I didn't get your name. What's your name? And that's the first time Connery just looks up and says, Bond, James Bond. And it's so calm. It's like the first time we see him as a panther on a branch of just holy mackerel. I want to see more of this guy. And that's the same now in My Darling Clementine with Henry Fonda. Walter Brennan and his sons, the Clanton boys, are sitting there looking suspiciously at Henry Fonda, and they don't know who he is. And that's the first time in this movie Henry gets up and he says, all right, and he moves to the door, and uh, and that's when Walter Brennan, as old man Clanton, says to him, didn't get your name. And uh, he turns, and while I'm reading, it's just wonderful, that same thing of, Erp, Wyatt Earp, and folks, if you're anything like me or Colonel Jeff, that's the moment you just go, wow. I mean, he just he Henry Fonda was always so great, but Wyatt Earp when he says it, and uh, and Walter Brennan, and he just exits there and pushes those doors open and leaves, and you can they show Walter Brennan and his sons just sitting there. And they're, they mean trouble. And they're going to get it. But that's a great magic movie moment to me. I, I want you to see it. It's a wonderful movie, folks. My Darling Clementine, directed by John Ford. And remember, when Orson Welles was asked in an interview to name the top three directors in Hollywood history, he said, John Ford, John Ford, and John Ford. And he was right. By God, he was a great storyteller. See that movie, folks. If you've seen it already a zillion times, see it another zillion times. If you've never seen it, see it. And then please write to us and tell me what you think. And uh, you know, you know what? By the way, though, it's 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 wonderful that I need good Wyatt Earp stories. I need to know. In fact, when Colonel Jeff and Dr. Chris and I went on our first big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place, we didn't get the fried chicken, but we went to the great Musso and Frank, which is on Hollywood Boulevard, and it's and has been here since 1917, when Hollywood was just starting, and it was just silent pictures, and boy, oh boy, Do I need, and that was the bar. Musso and Frank was where the real Wyatt Earp hung out for another 12 years till he passed away in 1929. And that bar's the same. And those stools are right there, the same way. And that's why we just said, you know what? That's where we're going for a couple of drinks. And we did. And... It was nice to know, and we'll do it again, too. But we sat where Wyatt Earp sat. 
And I need that. I like that. I love that we have it as Americans and that we share it, by the way. We just had daylight savings time, for instance, and uh, just a couple of days ago, and it it messes all of us up. I love it. I love daylight savings time. I can't believe no one ever says they love it. You know, there are always Americans who say, ah, what do we need daylight savings time for? You know, uh, who cares? And I can never understand that. I can't get it. I don't get it. I think it's just fantastic that we all get together and change the time. I just can't believe you can just do that. That uh, suddenly we decide and we make a law to change the time. Well, uh, what time is it? Uh, Six o'clock? No, we all say it's seven. And it'll change when we say so. I think that's terrific. And, uh, you know, we're sure that it, it, you know how this is. The light of day is different that day on the daylight savings time day. The d- first day after it's changed, the, the outside feels different. It's a wonderful way to be. It reminded me, by the way, that my mom and dad called me after the, uh, first wedding of my college friends, which is, oh, it's a while ago now. And, uh, but they called me. This was up in Massachusetts. And uh, they called me. The wedding was on uh, Saturday night. And they called me to remind me, well, that the next day, you know, it was Sunday, daylight savings time. I said, oh, all right, great, thanks. And uh, all right, I'll speak to you when I get home. And, that, uh, and I uh, told all my friends we went to get together again after the, well, the newly married couple had darted off to their honeymoon. And so we got together in the hotel bar and... Uh, I said to everyone, you know what, uh, hey, I just spoke to my folks and they reminded me uh, that uh, this is daylight savings time night and tomorrow is the first day, daylight savings time. And uh, so I'm just letting you guys know. And then they, they were glad. Whoa, thank you. That was, you know, because they need, everyone needs to be reminded of it in any way. And so the next day we all got up and met for breakfast and shook hands and hugged. And, oh, there are about 25 of us, I guess. And uh, it was nice, a first wedding. And uh, we all headed out. Some guys, this was, as I said, in Massachusetts, some were, were driving to Boston to catch a plane. And uh, some were, well, going by car to Albany and catch something there. And uh, I was uh, catching a train, by the way. I was going to get to, uh, how did I go? Oh, well, the Boston train station there. And uh, we all... Well, changed our watches, and we were, well, ahead of things, and that made us very happy. And when I got to the train station, it was the first time I realized when I went up to get my ticket that the clerk said to me, uh, well, this this is not daylight savings time. You, you've made a mistake. That's next week, and not today. And I said, as you would say, wait, what? And... There were, I knew there were 25 friends from school off in different airports and rental car places just saying the same, wait, what? And so well, you can make little mistakes with daylight savings time and nobody was going to insult my parents for missing it. Not to my face anyway. And they, you know what? It's a wonderful day to be. It's... Uh, and sure enough, something happened to me that was a little weird. It's fair enough to call this weird. That next day, Monday, the second day of daylight savings time, I, and this, we were on the mainland and I was back here at my house at Stately Miller Manor. And well, I just, you know, uh, felt a little tired. And, uh, so I went into one of, uh, it's just me and my wife and the doggies in the house. And you know that. One of my sons is in college and the other one is a Marine. And so I just uh, went in, well, about, I I was just tired. So it was, you know, close to full night time. And folks, I slept through the night. I mean, I just kind of blinked myself awake at 10 to 7 in the morning on Tuesday morning. And I said, wow, how do you like that? And I had plenty to do Tuesday. And I thought, woo, wow, whew. And that was a good night's sleep, too. And that was also weird dreams. I mean, they were vivid dreams. Not crazy. I was, uh, 
I was with a bunch of different women. I don't know about you, that's not weird to me. But I mean, in dreams, boy, how do you like that? And I got up, it was 10 to 7 now on Tuesday morning. And I thought, you know what, Bob, time to get up. I got a little early start. And uh, I went to make a pot of coffee. And I was going to sit down, as I always do. And I uh, noticed I stuck my head in our bedroom the uh, for my, me and my wife. And I, well, the lights were on in there. And uh, and she wasn't in the bed. And the covers were just all fluffed up. And I just thought, wow, that's that's a little strange. All right, okay. And I went and made that pot of coffee and sat down and uh, as I, well, as I put the coffee up and it's in a pot, so it, it brews, I just strolled out back into the kitchen. I noticed I looked outside all the big windows there and I thought, boy, it's a little strange day. It's stormy. It's, you know, it was uh, cloudy and uh, a little windy and, well, and I thought, plus, those are thick clouds. This is, it wasn't, you know wasn't the light of day it was it was you know dark and you know and i thought boy this is strange this is uh that's a little frightening actually to be that uh, that crazy to have the sky be that weird on a tuesday morning at seven and i uh as the coffee was brewing again i just wanted to check you know the doggies were downstairs i thought where maybe my wife had gone to watch a little TV in her office there and just sometimes falls asleep on the couch there. So I went in there and uh, stuck my head in and she was up just fine and uh, said, I said, hi, you doing, you all right? And she said, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the doggies were fine. And she said, yeah, I'm uh, thinking of uh, going upstairs and get, getting, uh, getting into bed, going to sleep. And I said, all right, good, good. Okay. And I uh, darted back out to get a cup of coffee. And I, as I poured a cup of coffee, I started start to go to sleep. It just struck me as a little odd because I looked out the windows again. Folks, it was now dark. I mean, this is, it was frightening to me. I didn't want to tell my wife because I didn't want her to think I was crazy or just afraid of everything. And uh, I'm telling you, I looked out that window and it was now dark. I thought, what in the world is this some kind of Stephen King story, or how could it be that dark? It now it was seven thirty in the morning. This it's never been like that. And I took that cup of coffee and I had a sip, and then I checked my cell phone, which just said. Now I was really getting scared because it said now Monday the uh, not Tuesday. It said Monday the twenty twenty second, and I uh, I thought, well, this this is a little weird. And uh, I, well, went back into my son's room there and just had another sip of coffee, put it on the coffee table there, the little nightstand, and just laid myself down in bed. Folks, it finally dawned on me, this wasn't Tuesday morning, it was Monday night. And I didn't know that, and this falling asleep I did is in quotes, I I fell asleep, I guess, but I woke up not at 6.50 on Tuesday morning, but on 6.50 p.m. Monday night. So I had only slept for about a half hour, 40 minutes, and so it was getting dark out because it was naturally getting dark out on Monday evening. Well, I don't know about you, but that's one of the things that I, good Lord, what the, that messed my head up a good bit of how did I, what the, who, and sure enough, my wife, God bless her, came up and just was ready, and she did that. She brushed her teeth and got into bed and and, and hit it, you know, and went to sleep because she was, she was all sacked out, and I just, I stayed in my kid's room. Just wondering, what in the world was that? Is that part of daylight savings time? <laughs> you know what? It reminded me, and I was talking to the colonel about this before, because in the 19th century here, see, because I love daylight saving times, but, you know, in the 19th century, there were no time zones yet. 
here in America, in our country. So every town and city in America had its own time. Now, I, I never quite knew that, but they just picked a time. The mayor and you know, a couple of people from the town there or the small city just picked a time. They'd look up and find when the sun was about in the center of the sky, and they'd say, okay, this is noon. We'll call this noon. And it was probably pretty accurate. They just picked it, as the colonel said before. In terms of the universe, it was probably pretty accurate. But you couldn't do anything with different cities. Trade was all all screwy because you're not knowing what the time is, not knowing what time zones are, not knowing when anything is anything made train travel very difficult, for one thing, because... No one knew what time to leave Boston and when it would arrive in Philadelphia because no one knew what time it was in Boston or Philadelphia. So even the train companies there in the 19th century, when train travel in America, you know, was, uh, well, was getting really, really big. So even though, though they would say at the train station that, uh, okay, well, the uh, train's leaving Boston at 2 and then it's getting into Philadelphia at 2. Uh, we think, but no one really was sure. And as I put it, every town and city across America would look up, find the sun at the center of the sky and say, okay, it's noon. So how did people know anything a thousand years ago? I, I just was wondering that. And before, as we were doing preparation for the show, I said, how did they even know? That's why I think that's why trappers and skinners in our country used to say, well, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, they would say to each other, okay, I'll meet in the spring. Because they meant that. That's when they would meet, in the spring. Why the spring? Because they could just say spring. They couldn't get there in the spring. Each one knew. Now, one might be three weeks early, and one might be three weeks late, or more, or less, but they would meet, hi, Bob, hi, Jim, and they would meet and go get a big mug of beer or something and talk about how the trade was. But, I mean, they met in the spring. And I love knowing that now. I love that we know more because we have daylight savings time. I love that we can, with if we have half a brain, know how great daylight savings time is and what it's for. I don't even know what it's for. When people would say... Well, it's because on the on farms, they get, they lets them get the chickens laying eggs more. I don't know. Is that true? I have no idea. But I love that we have daylight savings time. I know that, and you know that, and you and I, as you know, we know the same things. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, no matter what time it is, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a house to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And that's still the truest thing I know. Be well, no matter what time it is, and we'll see you here next time.